Okay, so this is lecture 25 of ECE 2305. Woo, it rhymes. And in today's lecture, we're going to be looking at the transport layer. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down memory lane first, and we're going to revisit what is the purpose of the transport layer. We're going to look at a network architecture. Remember the protocol architecture at the very first few lectures of this course. And we're going to see what role transport layer plays, right? The reason why we do layers, right, again, is we do a divide and conquer strategy with the protocol. Because imagine if you had to implement an entire modem and you're thrashing, you're like saying, oh, it needs this, it needs this, it needs that, it becomes unmanageable. Bugs will creep in, reliability is affected, cost goes up, right? So we break everything down into layers, right? And we looked at specifically one example, TCP IP. So today what we're going to look at is transport layers and services. Um, we're going to look at multiplexing and demultiplexing. And that is with respect to applications on the same host and how you get data from different apps all the way across the network and reconnect with corresponding apps on other hosts. May not be the same host, like you know, all, the, all this data flow. We're going to look at UDP and TCP, and then we'll look at the connection before we call it a day. <laughs> so I love going down memory lane. Boy, do I sound old. So uh, where is that pen? So I'm going to draw this diagram because I absolutely love it. So remember this, ah, the cloud, quite literally, uh, communication network. Okay, then what do we have? So we have the network access layer. I'm going to draw here, it wasn't there before, but I want to differentiate. This is the IP layer, internet protocol layer, right? Here's the transport layer. Layer. And remember those ports, right? And then this is the application layer. So that's computer one. This here is computer two. Right? Same thing. And then, again, computer three. Number three. So, internet layer, transport layer, application layer. And same thing here, application layer, I transport layer, and network access layer. And they're all connected to the network Right? Directly. And so what we saw, again, we've been, it's kind of cute. If we zoom in on this, from this course, what we've been doing is been progressively moving up these layers. So we have, like the network access layer, so we looked at a variety of technologies for enabling that. We've just finished off the internet protocol layer, and now we're looking at the transpor transport layer. In the last couple of lectures, in lectures 27 and 28, we're going to be looking at the topmost layer. We're going to be looking at the application layer. We're going to be looking at where this information originally gets generated and received for processing, right, on two different hosts. So in this course, we've been progressing up the layers from the physical all, and then um, the IP, like the IP addresses, uh, both IPv6 and IPv4. We're now doing data link, uh, sorry, the, sorry, not data link, transport layer, and then next week we're going to do application layer. And so what is the role of the transport layer? Is it the same as the IP layer? No. IP layer is just to get data right, from one computer to another. Transport layer is responsible for getting data from one app to another app. Right? So important. What ends up happening is the transport layer takes information from the application layer through one of the ports. And then 
it has a variety of different processes, like stream control, right? And all these other sort of protocols, like UDP and TCP are just a couple, where what we try and do is we try and support the transmission of data such that the application at the other end, right? Transport layer prepares things like that streaming data and, and multiplexing, because let's say I also get data from that port and that port. Oh, and I'm also receiving information from the IP layer and a bunch of packets. Remember that the packets are coming all which way. They're coming from there and there and there and there, right? And then we need a layer to stitch them all together as best they can, or request for a retransmission, or drop the packet, and then prepare it, wrap it up pretty, and give it to the application through one of the ports. And it probably has a bunch of ports to take care of all at the same time. So the transport layer is really responsible for bridging multiple applications with the multiple, well, multitude, okay, multitude of packets that are coming and going, right? So let's say you take that data, the transport layer packages it up ready for the IP layer. The IP layer with all the routing and everything that needs to do, it will say, okay, you need to go to that host. And then we go through the communication network and there are multiple routers, forward, forward. Oh, you want to go there, forward there, right? So in this cloud, you have all those routers. And it looks at the IP address and it has the forwarding tables and it forwards across the, the communication network into the other side. It gets, first of all, decoded and, and from the physical uh, transformation, then it goes into the IP layer. And then finally, the transport layer says, oh, hello, packets, and rearranges it for transmission or um, a reception into the application layer to your web host, uh, web uh, client, to your email client, or whatever application you have in the application layer, right? So the transport layer is different than with the uh, IP because the transport layer, its role is to take that stream of data and decompose it eventually, like takes it from the application layer and prepares it for the IP layer. And at the receiver, it takes all those package, uh, packets and stitches them back together into something that the application layer can use. That's really its role, right? And there's a bunch of other things, right? So we're going to be basically touching upon this diagram throughout the rest of today's lecture, all right? So I'm going to save this, okay? So click keep. Yeah, it's always that like, bad habit, right? And you don't click save or whatever. No, I lost like two hours of work and such. I'm not going to ask how many people here have like lost work because of a silly mistake. So, Doo -doo -doo. so what happens is the, uh, so that your transport layer provides that logical communication, right? So what your transport layer does, okay, is that it supports these application processes. And they can be anything, like that email client, the uh, web, uh, web server, the web client, um, anything, right? And what it does is that it supports the end-to-end. -end. So this is exactly what I was just mentioning, right? So the sending one, so let's go back here. The, it, this is actually a great summary. What happens is it breaks up that, that information, right? Right here. It gets it from the port, and what it does is it breaks up the uh, application message into those segments, making them ready to be transmitted over the network, right, as those packets. And then the receiver reassembles everything. And so as a result, you know, you might say, well, that seems easy, but what happens is we end up having two possible ways of doing it, UDP and TCP. And so the choice really depends on what you're hoping to achieve, right? Each application's different, right? As we're going to see. So I already gave away the, um, the secret before, but I'm, I'm going to save it and maybe surprise some people. Ha <laughs> ha. So network layer. So just like what I mentioned before, the network layer um, is just that logical connection between hosts, but not between applications, right? And so that's where the transport layer is. It's literally. Oh, that guy's web client with that guy's web server. OK, that's what I need to do through these ports. And that, they connect through that means, right? So the analogy here, it's a little corny, but uh, 
maybe, you know, if, like, let's say from, I, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with how interdepartmental mail works here. It's pretty good, but, you know, sometimes the mailman gets kind of mad if you don't, like, fill out the proper building and stuff. Like, you know, just for fun. So what happens is, suppose you got 10 profs here in ECE, and for some reason we're just sending lots of mail to mechanical engineering, just, just for fun. It's like, you know, um, and what ends up happening is um, these 10 profs represent those 10 application layer processes. So I could be, I'm not sure, what would I be? Like, if I were an application, I would be blank, you know, web server, um, an email client, I don't know. Skype, you know. So, so what happens is, suppose those ten profs, like in this analogy, actually represent some sort of application, and the ten profs in uh, mechanical engineering are the counterpart um, application. So let's say these letters are something like I send in, um, a letter to Professor Dimitriou. So he does a lot of control stuff, mostly nonlinear. I do a lot of comm stuff. And it's like, hey, if we can combine these two together, we can take over the world, right? And that's my letter. How does that work? Well, yes. Shh. No one tell anything. So what ends up happening is I send this letter, and you probably see these little white basket things or the bags and such. And what happens is the white WPI van drives around campus. It goes to department to department. And then everyone's mail, all the other professors' e uh, mails, they go into this bag. And then all of a sudden, it's dropped off in Higgins' lab. And then it gets sorted out into everyone's mailboxes. And then, ta-da, it's received. Same exact thing. I know, I make these corny analogies. But what ends up happening is each, every prof is an application. The two departments are separate hosts, right? The cool host, electrical and computer engineering host, and then mechanical, mechanical engineering host, right? And what ends up happening is the, the messages from the application are those letters. Now, what happens is the transport protocol is essentially, like, you know, if you asked uh, Miss uh, uh, Cotter or Miss Sweeney or Miss um, uh, Emerton, like, you know, here comes this big bag. Like, you know, the mail doesn't magically just go into the professor's mailboxes. What happens is they look at it, oh, Wiglinski, bloop, um, Loof, bloop, and they do that, right? And they sort it out, right? And in mechanical and every other department, they do that. So there needs to be someone translating this stuff. They, those individuals, would be considered the transport layer. They're the ones that take the messages and put it to the correct application and stitch it together, right? And so, and then the network protocol would just basically be that truck, right, going around campus and stuff. I've never actually been in that truck. It would be so cool to be in one. Okay, so the problem here is that we have two of these protocols, UDP, which would be frightening. Imagine on campus, what happens is I'm sending this really important letter to Professor Dimitriou, and what ends up happening is, best effort, but the truck had a flat tire and lost a bag. And, oh, okay, you can't retransmit. Oh, drats. My plans for taking over the world have been foiled, right? And then there's TCP IP, because I'm determined that I want to resend the information. It's like, Professor Dimitriou, following up our discussion, here's a repeat send of our plans for world domination, right? And then what happens is, what's really interesting, neither of these services can make guarantees on delay, because... What happens about the, the network? You cannot control anything. Once that message leaves your host, your computer, it's up to the wild. It's up to the internet. If it goes down a bad path, it gets stuck in a server, or maybe it's being sniffed right, by some three-letter agency, and it incurs a little bit of a time penalty. Like, you know, whatever you use, don't use certain words in that message, right? Like, world domination probably would not really go well if it's being, you know, packet sniffed along the way. Um, and the other thing is bandwidth. Yes? Um, would the only thing it would use in terms of the internet is UDP being, like, live streaming something? Because you're not going to get it if the message gets it? Or so, mm -hmm. it seems like pretty much everything, like, reloads if it doesn't. For, for some applications. I'm, I, but let's say you have something, like, for instance, like, um, hmm. let me see. Let me see if I can bring this up. Uh, I don't want to use Bing because I don't have very good experiences with Bing. 
this guy. Boop. So this guy, so this is what we, in 227, you probably see these white boxes, right, on top of the computers. So this is what we call a USRP N210. Ah, now I know how to zoom in. So check this out. So this has a, sort of a network interface, but it does not use TCP IP. So this guy here, instead, he uses UDP because in this case, it's just sending uh, packetized data from, uh, that's being converted from an onboard FPGA, right, that takes over-the-air signals, samples them, packages them uh, using this FPGA, and then it says, OK, I'm going to use UDP packets and send it over to the computer host for further processing. And the reason why we do that is because if you have the, ret the retransmission and such, by it, it, because uh, essentially the uh, analog to digital, digital analog converters here are operating 100 mega samples per second. By the time we wait for the retransmission, that data is totally old. So there are applications where, like in this case, where UDP, it's like, oh, don't even bother. Like, you know, it's like, if you didn't get the data, don't worry about it. I'm going to just send you more data. So, so some cases like this hardware and the application that runs on top of it, uh, we just take the hit, right? So, so yeah, but, and, and there are some folks that say, oh, I just need to send you data. I don't care if it doesn't make it all entirely. And TCP IP, on your hand, or TCP, it, it's totally a different story. I do want that information to be retransmitted. So that's a great question. I really wanted to bring this up. So that, excellent question. Ha <laughs> ha. Ah, so <coughs> bandwidth guarantees. Yeah, that's the other thing. If, um, if you don't have enough bandwidth between point A and B, you know, no guarantee. You have no control over the internet, right? You're at the mercy of every other server or router between point A and point B. Unless you use internet too, then that's totally different. So multiplexing, demultiplexing, totally corresponds to this again. So let's bring up my diagram. What I mentioned before, what happens is the application layer might be sending multiple streams from multiple applications. The transport layer needs to be handling all of this, right? So it's all going into the layer, and it needs to dole out packets down to the internet protocol layer to get that information across in a stream to whoever, whether it's going to be this guy or this guy, ah, or maybe someone else that's connected on the network that this computer is intending to transmit to. At the same time, so that's multiplexing. Demultiplexing is we have data coming in and it needs to go to specific applications on the computer, right? So what we're doing is we have all these packets, OK, right, the sorting of the mail process. I'm peeling away the pile of mail to the corresponding ports to go to the corresponding applications. <laughs> so at the end of the day, we have this process. And we try and do something called connectionless demultiplexing, where what happens is you know, we create a segment and send it into a UDP socket. And we need to specify, first of all, the IP address and the port number. And when we receive it, we, we check the destination port. And direct, it directs the segment to the socket with that port. So really, it's like very simple forwarding. We just slush this information given like you know, th these, these um, segments of data based on, OK, who is it for and which port? And we're just going to send this data streaming in. Right? And what ends up happening is that those IP datagrams, like what ends up happening is here, you know, we have the different source IP addresses, and they will also be directed, in this case, to the same socket at that destination. And then here with the connection oriented uh, DMUX, here what we have, we have a, uh, I don't even, you would call a quatuple? Is that how you would say it? I, don't, I guess you would call it four tuple, but I'm wondering if there's a nicer way of saying it. So you have this four tuple, source IP, source port number, and then destination IP, and destination port number. So end to end, you know where it's coming from, port. And we know that applications are tied to ports. And we also have the identity of the computer right, through the interface, the IP address. And then we also know the destination, port. So we know which application it wants to go to. 
and we also have its IP address to recognize it. So we have these identifiers. Let's not even talk about MAC addresses. We can really identify this guy, right? And then the UDP, like what I mentioned before, I love this. It's best effort, right? Like just like right now, it's like I'll do my best to get these signed ECDR forms to register by five today. You know, it, like, actually, it's really cool. Like, you know, all of you should just be on the quad, get a lawn chair, you know, just see the stream of professors converge to Daniels and then emanate from Daniels. That is routing in action, right? The application is delivery of ECDR forms. Oh, it's so cool. Anyways, I digress. I'll be one of those guys. So what happens is best effort means I'm going to do the best I can to get the information across using the means at hand, like, you know, the network routing protocols, whatever I'm equipped with, I'm going to get that information across. But if it's dropped, mm, you know, there's, it's like, you know, there's no guarantees. Remember that. There's no guarantee. And so the connection list, this is the other thing about UDP, no handshaking. Right? TCP IP, uh, sorry, TCP is like, okay, do you hear me? Yep, let's get started. So there's this feedback. With UDP, it's just like, here you go. And it's like, oh, oh, you're just collecting a bunch of packets as they zoom in, right? And so, uh, you know, again, like, uh, Elliot, your question about, you know, where's UDP used for? Streaming multimedia, right, on the network, uh, DNS and SMTP, uh, SM, SNMP, right? But you have a lot of these other sort of unique applications like the radios in 227, right? Where if you just need, you know, no handshaking, just get me the data. If I lose a few, c'est la vie, as they say in French. It's like, that is life. <laughs> so what happens is there are here a few details about what a UTP segment header looks like. It's eight bytes. Um, again, you have source port number, destination port number. Uh, you have a checksum. Oh, that's really cool. And um, what happens is, again, like, why, why is there a UDP, okay? So, and the thing is, UDP is faster in the sense of, imagine if you have to retransmit, do, 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 and then you have to buffer and connect everything together. Oh, it takes forever. On the other hand, with UDP, it's just like, here you go, here's more information, right? Yeah. All right. And then the UDP checksum. So here it's just really to check if there are errors. If there are, you either correct them or forget about it, you know. So the sender, what happens is, um, what it does is it takes those segments and then, um, you know, there's a checksum. Usually it's like a ones complement sum um, of the segment contents and then puts it into the UDP checksum field. So what happens is, here's your data. There's a ones complement thing to, to like, you know, what happens is at the receiver, it says it will do the exact same calculation. If they are off, then something has happened with the data, right? This is assuming sans coding, no coding whatsoever. If there's coding, the coding will kick in to also try and correct any errors. But with UDP in general, all it does is, is there an error or is there not an error? Okay, and then the receiver tries to see if there is an issue with the checksum. Now, with the TCP, that's point to point. You have a sender, you have a receiver, and uh, you have that demultiplexer. So if we go back to this guy, remember at the receiver, what happens is your transport layer is now doing that uh, sorting, if you will, of all packets to the corresponding applications and ports, right? So what ends up happening is uh, it might even support multiple TCP sockets. So we're going to have segments. There are maximum sizes for those segments. Um, and uh, in some cases, the TCP header is about 20 bytes and, uh, for the MTU, right? The, um, for this, the, um, this, the maximum length of the link frame is 1,500 bytes. And so the structure of itself, like, so here's a lot of, you know, sort of potpourri things that you can do on Friday night. So, you know, it would be really cool to have, like, 2305 trivia. Like, do you know how big your header in the TCP frame is or something? No. So what happens is you have things like a sequence number, an acknowledgement number. So we saw a sequence number. That's vital if we're going to stitch together TCP uh, segments, right? You have a checksum. It's 16 bits. 
And then you know what the sequence number does, which means it orders all the TCP segments together in the right order. Otherwise, it's gobbledygook. And acknowledgement's important because you've got to act it. And remember that the sender and receiver might have different sequence numbers. Okay, finally, the connection. Remember, UDP does not have a handshake, only TCP. Remember, UDP is just dumping information. TCP is like, connection established? Yes. And so what TCP does is they both agree to the connection and, and form that, that link to then communicate information. And if anything's lost or needs to be retransmitted, it can do, do so easily. And again, a lot, uh, you can also do something called a TCP three-way handshake. right? So that's kind of interesting where what happens is you have three, three hosts and you can communicate information between, between all of them. And then finally, closing connection. You need, so one thing for your fourth experiment, don't, do not forget to, turn, to close the uh, socket. The, this is sort of a reminder. Um, and, and the same thing happens with TCP. When you're done, you need to indicate um, with something like a, that you, that, you know, sort of end the file. And then it acknowledges it, and then that's done. So with that, that is lecture 25. So don't forget tomorrow's lecture. Oh my god, hello.